boom or more economic gloom? As the dust settles on Jeremy Hunt's first budget, what will it all mean for you? Plus, is the government about to ban TikTok from its phones? This is Politics Live. With me today, Conservative MP Danny Kruger, Shadow Employment Minister Alison McGovern, CEO of Best for Britain Naomi Smith and Reem Ibrahim from the Institute for Economic Affairs. Coming up, an upbeat assessment from the Chancellor. He's cheerful, should you be? The things that are going to really matter, that are going to pay for the NHS in the long run, are things where we are doing very, very well. Labour says it's pension tax cuts for the rich and thin gruel for everyone else. This billion pound or more giveaway is the wrong priority when ordinary people are facing a cost of living crisis. A big giveaway for parents, but is everyone happy? It's a good news day for childcare. They want to be the best, they want to do the best for parents. Then they need to fund it and, you know, they need to put their hands into their pockets a little bit more deeply. We've heard a lot about cutting migration in recent years. The answer to the present stresses and strains is not to reach for that same old lever of uncontrolled immigration. Overall migration, net migration, however you want to call it, needs to come down. But is it all talk? Net migration shows no sign of dropping. Another planning committee meeting and then another and and what can we learn from Jeremy Clarkson about planning permission? Right, so let's start with something from about a year ago. Cast your minds back and take a look at this. Hi folks, this is Boris Johnson here, launching the number 10 TikTok site. And you won't necessarily catch me dancing on this site, but we will... So that was Boris Johnson launching the number 10 TikTok site. Now we're hearing that the government is looking, expected to announce shortly, that it's going to ban that Chinese-owned social media app TikTok from government ministers' phones on security grounds. Is that the right thing, Danny Kruger? Well, let's see. I think there is an announcement due. I don't want to preempt that. My concern, of course, is that we have a, uh, the, a company that is effectively controlled by a, by a power which, if not a... Uh, an enemy of this country is at least a strategic challenge to the security of, of the UK and of the West. And so I think it's absolutely right that the government's looking at this. Let's right see to what ban it? Well, let's, 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 have a, let's, have a, let's have a good look at it. But, it. but in principle, I don't think it's right that, the, uh, that, a, that a essentially a Chinese state firm uh, is in UK government phones. Well, it's not a Chinese state firm. TikTok says it denies all allegations yeah. that it hands its data to China, of course. It's mm. important to say that. Do you use it? Well, it's on my phone. I must say I don't look at it very often. And I might, ba I might delete it now that I've heard about these anxieties. What about your children? Well, indeed. I mean, I don't like my children watching using TikTok. They're still very young. So I think there is a, there's a whole separate conversation to be had about online harms and safety. But from this security perspective, I think it's probably right that the government uh, thinks very, uh, very strongly about it. What about Labour, Alison? Thinking about not using TikTok, walking away yeah, from this party? Yeah, look, if... if the government should respond to their security advice. I'm a little bit worried that it's like shutting door after this horse is long gone, given what you just showed us there of Boris Johnson I mean, of course, announcing the TikTok Social account. media look, moves quickly and, they, and policy does tend to catch they, up. They right have or to wrongly. respond to the, to the security advice. That's very important for the government to do that. And, you know, we would support them absolutely. I would just say on the children and young people thing, I'm very proud of children and young people in my constituency who responded to the COVID lockdown by, you know, learning how to use new technology. It has to be within safety guide rails. But I think their ability to creatively, you know, shape their own learning is really impressive. So I don't think we should be so negative about technology for children and young people where it's done safely and Are you where it can about help people. TikTok though? Yes, of course. If the government's got very serious security advice that's led them to do this, you know, that is a massive concern. As I say, I think that there are questions to be asked about why this hasn't happened sooner, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But 
we should be on it when it comes to security. Naomi, that point that Alison makes about this balance between the good of social media for young people and the potential dangers, where do you sit on this and on TikTok in particular? Well, on TikTok in particular and the issue around geopolitical security, uh, this move means we're following what our allies in the US and the EU and Canada have already done. They've already banned uh, government uh, uh, ministers from having TikTok on their mobile phones. So we're sort of playing catch up on, on that front. And I note that Tom Tugendhat hasn't ruled out banning uh, TikTok entirely from the UK for, for, for the average user uh, as well as ministers. And our security is essential. Like, of course, that is the first role of government to keep us secure. And so I think we do have to think about Britain's soft power, our place in the world, where we are now. Um, and we shouldn't be playing catch up with our other allies. It's a we should be. Site, isn't it, it is very popular, and I do use it myself. It is so addictive. <laughs> like once you start, I mean, Reem will know better than me, but once you start scrolling on TikTok, it's incredibly difficult to get yourself off it. So for that reason alone, Maybe we yeah, parents do need to be really We've careful. Got confessions about of TikTokers. About <laughs> how often children are allowed to use. I mean, Reem, you are a TikTok user. What do you think about this? Idea? I am a TikTok user, but I think that the security issue is a completely separate issue to the, the the safety of young people and children. I mean, clearly, what we're seeing here is that there is this security risk. Obviously, TikTok have already said that they completely separate uh, the data used by uh, the West and and China themselves. However, we know that that's probably a complete lie. We know that, that there is this data risk. This is a complete separate issue though to young people and actually I think you're absolutely right young people have been incredibly creative with the use of TikTok I use TikTok myself to try and get young people involved in politics trying to break down the ideas of politics in this in the current state of the day okay thank you so we'll we'll keep an eye because as you said Danny we think we're expecting an announcement on this pretty soon that the government may look at banning it but I just want to move on to something else that has been developing uh, during the course of the morning um, and that is an update on the ongoing negotiations around some of the industrial action that uh, has been taking place I think we can speak to our employment correspondent Zoe Conway Zoe can you just fill us in on what the latest is it looks like we are very close to an agreement between the health unions, the government and employers over pay. Um, what I understand is being offered is that for this financial year, that's 2022-23, well over £1,000 as a one-off payment is being offered to ambulance workers, nurses, um, physiotherapists, midwives. But for 23-24, a pay rise close to 5%, so certainly more than 3.5%, close to 5%, I understand. Now, the critical point here is, are the unions going to recommend this offer to their members? And it's not entirely clear whether all the unions are going to do so. The key unions that the government needs to get on board are the GMB, uh, Unison and the RCN and that's because they represent the most health workers so that's nurses and ambulance workers and other health staff but other unions might not back it does that matter well forgive me for introducing the horrendous phrase electoral college but some of these unions have got more votes than others so if the government gets Unison RCN the GMB on board backing this offer then we could be looking at a deal. And this might um, be announced, we think, at around 3 o'clock this afternoon. All the unions are meeting this afternoon and we're expecting an announcement around this um, around then. Zoe, that's really helpful. Thank you very much for bringing us up to date. So, Alison, it looks like the government might be close to reaching a resolution, solving this. That's good, wouldn't I mean, it be? I, you've got to hope so. This has been an extraordinarily stressful period for patients and NHS staff alike, and we all want it to come to an end. You would expect me to be critical of the government, and I do wonder why we couldn't have got to this position a bit more swiftly. Could we not have worked a bit more quickly to get to this point? I wonder. However, we all want the strikes to come to an end, not least our dedicated NHS staff, who've been through extraordinary stressful circumstances over the past couple of years and frankly you know deserve better treatment by the government. Danny has this just taken far too long because this has been dragging on for months and months there's been widespread and prolonged industrial action hasn't there? Well yes and I, I mean I'd echo Alison's point about the need to reward and recognise the work that health workers do and have done uh, particularly in recent years. The, the challenge has been that in many cases these unions were setting out positions which were completely 
uh, unrealistic. So, I mean, the BMA asking for a 35 percent pay increase for junior doctors, for instance. They, but isn't that the take nature it, of a negotiation? Well, is, you go in high yes, and then but, you negotiate. But, but the result is that it then takes quite a long time to get to a realistic position, which is where it looks like we're getting to now. And I applaud the government for its for its steps. Of course, the other point is pay is set in this country by an independent review process, and it's appropriate that that uh, has the opportunity to try and work. I'm pleased the government is now directly negotiating, but it did. Have, we did have to go through this to get there. Give, I mean, also given the stress that people have faced, I was amazed yesterday that the Chancellor um, didn't adopt Labour's plan on NHS staff because it's not just pay, it's also retention. People haven't got enough colleagues at the moment. It's too stressful. We need to bring more staff into the NHS as well. Hold that thought, because we are just about to move on now and talk in some detail about that budget, of course, which was a significant announcement, as budgets always are, from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, yesterday. Um, I want to have a look at one of the elements of that budget, which is proving to be uh, politically contentious. Take a look at this headline, uh, which was the front page of the Daily Mirror today. It says... Pots for the rich. Now, that is referring uh, to the decision by Jeremy Hunt to scrap the cap on tax free pension savings, which had stood at £1 million. Um, given that that was the only cut to personal taxation in this budget, is that fair, Danny Kruger? Well, this was a response to a real problem. We were just talking about NHS staff. We have thousands of doctors, senior doctors, particularly GPs, who are being forced out of the workforce, out of the NHS, because it does not pay to work because of the cap on the, uh, on the pension system. They have been lobbying, I think, with absolute justice for months and months now for a reform which would enable people who are at the top of their profession and therefore well, earning well, and we need to keep those people in the NHS. Uh, to have a reform to the pension system that would enable them to stay. And it's not just doctors. This applies across the public sector and indeed to entrepreneurs as well. We need these senior people to continue to work. And what the government has done is to put in place a means by which they can continue to do that. And we can help to get doctors back working for the NHS. Alison, you've said that Labour would reverse this position. This is an extraordinarily expensive sledgehammer to get to this knot. I think it's clear we could have had a scheme for doctors. You know, we need to resolve that issue. But... By no means are all the people who are going to gain from this um, doctors. And actually, that this was a priority really shocked me yesterday. You know, we know that people have lived through really challenging times, shopping going up every week, bills and so on, that this featured. And it's about a billion pounds, just over a billion pounds each and every year forever. You know, it's, it, this is not a one-off thing. But, Alison, if it's, been done, it's a really expensive policy for a really yeah. small number of very wealthy people. So the and the idea, the idea that you had to have this expansive um, tax cut handing huge amounts of money to people who are already doing very well strikes me as not believable at all. Okay. I, I don't think Danny, we need briefly, to... and then right. I want so to there, bring well, the There, there are people we need in the workforce, and as I say, it's not just doctors. Yeah, there's people across the, it's across, it across the public sector. And the, and, the, and, the, and the policy, the budget as a whole, and the whole autumn statement from last year massively benefits the, people in the lowest distribution of the income scale at the expense the, of the wealthy. The so we are, this, is, this is a redistributive okay. the OBR, budget. The OBR says that the, the effect of this in bringing people back to the workforce will be very, very small indeed. The big impact is about handing taxpayers' money back to people who are already very okay. wealthy. There's lots more that we could have done. OK, Naomi. The, the Chancellor was talking about boot camps, using that phrase, boot camps, to get the over 50s back to work while giving the very richest a tax break to work I mean, longer. this is it, voluntary. He's it, talking it, about a voluntary support programme, but, isn't but, he? But it, it's, it's the rich getting a carrot while the poor get a stick. You know, wages are depressed. Not a stick, it's the a, last it's thing we need support. is more wealth inequality, which is what this will do. Um, and I think it's why Starmer's emphasis on dignity could actually really cut through, because there's absolutely nothing dignified um, about being told to attend a boot camp. The, the, what's got to be remembered in all of this is about living standards and growth and debt are all looking very, very bleak. And and this uh, scrapping of the, the cap on the pensions cap, cap does nothing to, to address any of that. The rate of growth looks set to fall again after uh, going up a little bit, but be consistently below target. And living standards uh, on households 
uh, are facing the biggest two-year fall since the 1950s. And we're potentially looking, Danny, at two decades mm. of real terms w uh, wage uh, stagnation, okay. if not depression. I mean, that is an OBR... That's, since that, the Victorian that's, times. That's from the Office that. of Budget Responsibility who makes that point. Real household disposable incomes falling in the UK, it's expected to drop by 6%, which would be the largest two-year fall in living standards, Reem. So was this a fair budget? It, it absolutely wasn't fair because, of course, this does not go far enough. And I think that when we're talking about, uh, you know, letting elder people go back into work. Jeremy Hunt himself said that this, the incentive behind this was that he didn't want people to be incentivised to, to be leaving work as a result of tax. But unfortunately, this is the right step. This is a step in the right way forward. But actually, the, the majority of people in this country are being dragged into higher tax brackets, are being dragged as a result of this fiscal drag with inflation. People are paying more tax than they ever were before since the Second World War. We've got the highest tax burden since the Second World War. This is absolutely unacceptable. And actually, if the government wants to go for growth, they need to be cutting taxes. I mean, Danny, that is right, isn't it, actually? Because freezing the income tax threshold yes. means that a lot more people are going yes. to be paying more income tax. And think, I think it's effectively about 4p on the basic rate. Were you comfortable with no, that? No, I, I deeply regret that. I think I, I recognise that point absolutely. Not, not, not raising the threshold in line with, with growth and with inflation is very, very pa painful. What the government's doing, though, and I think to its credit, is enforcing the underlying conditions of growth in the economy. So they're particularly the best thing that the, gov the government announced on this yesterday was the full expensing. So any money that businesses put into investment in their in their business and into capital, they can claim back from their taxable so profits. So they raised the so, corporation tax headline, but they said that so they the, made this point the, that effectively, if you invest, you can have a tax effect, cut. Effective tax cut for for businesses, which will help to grow the economy and to create jobs. There's also more investment in R and D uh, and in investment I, zones and so on. So I think the, the, the underlying conditions are improving, but I do share the point that we do need to get to a point where we're reducing... We are the only tax country in the G7 that are increasing corporation well, tax. Well, we're still the lowest I, corporation but, tax okay. in the G7. Alison. But actually, investment in businesses happens when periods of political stability, where a government sets out a mission and what they're trying to achieve. I mean, and to actually, be fair been to a, Jeremy Hunt, that's, a, set, that's what he says he's trying to do now. Really? Because all I heard yesterday was this tax bunk for the wealthy, the business investment thing, the consequences of which are uncertain, it's very expensive too. The childcare thing, which I think we'll come on to, which there are challenges We will, with. we will. Other than that, this is a steady state Tory budget. It doesn't consider the past 13 years and think structurally what has gone wrong here? Why is our rate of growth so low? Why is productivity fallen? Why is people's pay not really growing? It's not asking themselves the right questions and therefore it's, would, they so don't really have a plan. This is about trying to get through to the next election. Okay. It's not really changing anything. But, so what, would, what would Labour do on personal income? taxation? What level would they set income tax at? So we will consider that before the next manifesto. I'm sure that you wouldn't expect me to write it here on television. I mean, it's not that far away um, now, the general election, is it? We're very right, much well, in that run-up territory. Well, then we won't have to wait very long before we set out in details all of our plans. What we've done is identified areas, for example, the non-DOMS loophole, which is dreadful that that still exists, and we'll put that money into breakfast clubs, which will help parents, you know, and that could be done quite quickly. So we've tried to identify ways which we could help immediately, and we'll set out more plans at the uh, manifesto. I mean, but people I do, just, do want to know do, these basic things, though, don't they, do about what they're going to be paying under oh, a Labour course, government, what course. the policies are going to look like under a Labour government. Of course, and that's the point of having a manifesto. But I just want to make this point. What is the mission for our economy? Is it to rebalance because we know that too much economic growth comes from too small a geographical area? Is it to tackle inequality? From listening to Jeremy Hunt yesterday, I thought his only mission was to get through to the next general election. Can I answer that? And I Josh? hope it comes before too long. Mm. On that point, Danny? Well, the, the mission is straightforward. It's to boost growth. Uh, particularly by tackling inflation. And yes, Alison, you're absolutely right, and this is where we share a, a common vision. We've got to rebalance our economy. It is totally wrong, and you're right to point out the structural challenges, which go back well beyond the last 13 years. They go back to the end of the, uh, the Cold War, to the whole era of globalisation. The under so, the Tory Well, well, well okay. uh, exacerbated but, uh, under, uh, under Blair. And we have to, have to restructure the economy, but the first thing to do is to get growth back again. OK, and, and the elephant in the room on a lot of that growth is our relationship with Europe and our small and medium-sized organisations 
up and down the country who are faced with crippling Brexit red tape, for whom there is now very little in the way of any kind of support fund. All of the investment R&D uh, tax credits for larger organisations that they don't get access to. And they are struggling to trade with our nearest and largest trading partner. Um, and they are squealing out for help. They need it. And they are having to uh, deal with the uncertainty about whether we're going to align with Europe on certain standards, whether we are not, whether we're going to be doing deals with another uh, country or block of countries that means we would have to change the, the standards by which we produce products and meaning we may not be able to sell so much into the EU. The, the lack of certainty for business up and down the country is absolutely damaging them. Bigger companies really? can box around it, SMEs can't. Is There's Brexit the elephant in the room here well, when it comes to economic growth? No, I don't think it is. And I think that Danny can use the word growth and the government, the Chancellor can use the word growth, but actually that means nothing if they're implementing policies that are actively crushing growth. We now at border, uh, we border, border Island, Ireland has a 50% lower corporation tax than the United Kingdom. We're already seeing companies move over to those other countries that have low corporation tax. AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca for example, moved a £320 million investment over to Ireland because of our corporation tax being so high. So we can use the word growth, but actually if we're implementing policies that are crushing growth, this government does not support the economy. OK, I want to talk about something else that was in the budget. So we're going to stay on subject, but look at a slightly different element now. Um, and that was childcare. Now, this was to some degree the centre piece Jeremy Hunt might have thought of his budget. He announced an extension of the free hours that parents can claim. So it's extended 30 hours free childcare to children over the age of nine months. So that's one and two year olds effectively for working parents. That's going to be phased in over a period. I just want to show you this uh, headline from the uh, Telegraph, I think it is. It's, it's a piece that's written by Miriam Cates, a Conservative MP. She says there, the Treasury is nationalising childhood. She goes on to say, the Chancellor would do better to let parents decide for themselves how to care for their offspring. Um, it says the Financial Times on there, but that was a piece in the Telegraph, just to be clear. Danny Kruger, is she right? Well, she didn't write the headline, which I think is an exaggeration, but I, I share her general view, absolutely, yes. I mean, I'm, it's very good that the government is putting a lot more money into early years. We absolutely need to do that. We need to support families and we need to help people who want to return to work early. But I don't think we should be mandating the, the decision that parents should want to take for themselves. Many parents would like that money. They might want to spend it more flexibly to, have, to pay for themselves to look after their children or to pay their, their relatives or, or, or an informal child-minded. The idea that it all has to go into these big nurseries, I think, is a mistake and it's not the best use for the money. Alison? Well, this is precisely about... Childcare is all about the choice of women, largely parents in general, but largely women. It's all about saying that it should be perfectly possible to be a mom and have a great career. And for a long time, we haven't really had that choice for women and parents in our country. The last Labour government made progress. You know, there has been some progress. And obviously, it's good to see um, that announcement yesterday. What I worry about is nothing's really going to change for quite a while. You know, this, the, the investment's not coming... Um, until a bit further down the track. It's being phased and, and think, in, isn't it? And that yeah, is partly and I, I because think, there think, has to be capacity in the sector which has been right. under strain. And I think, t I think two things. I think, as I said before, I think using that non-DOMS money to help schools provide breakfast clubs would, could be done much more quickly, which is why we've identified it. I also think we need, be, we need to be thinking about reform and how we build a skilled workforce because it's not just that women need to be free to have careers and parents in general do, but it's also that the early years is such a crucial time for education and you know, preschool. So we need to think about how our brilliant, skilled childcare workforce can be developed and helped as well through this. Okay. And there was not a word on that yesterday. OK, I mean, this was not This was a, a significant extension of the existing scheme. I'm sure that there are parents, as you mentioned, that would welcome uh, this extra childcare. It's going to cost about £4 billion a year. Reem, you're from a, a free market think tank. Is this the right use of public money? No, it isn't. And I think that what we're doing at the moment is we're throwing taxpayer money in an already broken system. We've got to really ask, us, ask ourselves the question, why are childcare costs so high? We've got some of the most stringent child-to-staff ratios in the world. Well, they're being relaxed now. And, and, and now and they're going from one to four to one to five. Absolutely. But, but if, we were to, if we were to mirror, actually, so, for example, the Norwegian system, where they have much lower childcare ratios, it's expected that childcare costs could actually sorry, cut by half. The, the, in, the, in the Scandinavian system, they have much better developed systems of childcare than we do. And, you know, the, the idea that somehow... Cutting the ratios is just like going to be an absolute panacea is is not right at all, I'm afraid. But 
you know, you, we need, as I say, to develop that workforce properly over time. There are things that we could do immediately to help people, but we need that much bigger plan. We didn't hear about that yesterday. And this one size okay. fits all, though, let's just okay, deal I just, with the ratio. I, I want, it's not right. I want to talk about the principle behind the state intervening on this extent when it comes to providing childcare. Have a look at this from the IFS. This is their take on it, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, of course. Childcare reforms create a new branch of the welfare state but also huge risks to the market. Naomi, what do you make of that, this idea that actually the state is really extending its offer now, paying for childcare much more broadly than it was before? For far too long, we've had uh, government policies that could be best described as antinatalist, disincentivising uh, parents from wanting to have children because of the exorbitant cost, uh, either the cost of actual childcare or the opportunity cost of leaving the workforce in order to do that childcare, knowing how much harder it's going to be for you to re-enter once they're at school, uh, maybe having to take um, a, a pay cut or a step back in your uh, career development to be able to do that. So broadly, absolutely welcome uh, into interventions that are designed to help more people get back into work and to incentivise us to have children. We have an ageing population uh, and we have uh, successive governments perhaps failing on it but trying to tell us that they want to limit migration. Not a view I hold. So I think it, it, it's right that we're trying to do this. Uh, However, it is worth noting that the, the, the lowest uh, income households won't benefit from this. So if you're a, a, a trainee nurse, for example, you won't be eligible well, if to access this. The, the, the offer to people on universal credit was also extended. So you would yes. now get your childcare costs paid up front rather than arrears and there is more money available. But I, I want to stick to the principle here about the, the role of the state, Reem. Well, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that actually the, the state shouldn't be intervening when it comes to childcare regulations. And the thing is, I think the welcome move is obviously the reduce, reduction in, in ratios but actually you raise an important point here that people aren't having children at the rates that they should be and actually we do have an aging population and the primary reason for this is actually a lot of these and I think we could sort of talk about this very broadly within the budget that there aren't many policies here for young people talk about housing for example we do not build nearly enough houses as we should and it's partly as a result of planning regulations partly as a result of this higher cost of living and people aren't having children as a result direct result of government intervention direct result of these government stringent regulations. And people are leaving university having to repay student loans on yeah. variable interest rates in line with tax. What help in the budget was was there for them? Danny? Very and, little. And on this idea about the size of the state, is, is mm. small government dead? Well, it seems to be uh, pretty comatose. <laughs> uh, we've got the highest taxes and the highest spending, the highest debt since the Second World War. And ultimately, we'll only reduce that spending by reducing demand on the state, which is by reinforcing the sources of strength in our society, which are families and communities and businesses. And to do that, we need an agenda that will help families in particular. I mean, my, my, I, I share the points that have just been made, and I think that the, the critical answer in this space is to give more flexibility to parents. Four billion pounds a year is an enormous amount of money. We should put that directly into parents' pockets, people who have children, for them to decide how... But isn't how the point this does give flexibility well, yeah. to parents because it allows them to make the choice no, about going makes, to work or not and if no, they couldn't previously... It only, make, it only gives them one choice, which is to put your child into, a, into one of these big nurseries. No. And, and, only, and only, by the way, parents for whom the timing fits. That's, only in term time, only, only in the sorry, daytime. But, but that's just not the case. There's about eight different schemes that support people with childcare in this country at the moment. So that's just not right. We do need to look at it and say, OK, well, what would be the best way to support well-paid expert childcare staff to provide really good quality of care? And that's my frustration that we're not really in that conversation. I just say on this issue of, you know, the market, business is ahead of politics in this. They're ahead of us. Businesses know that to get good staff these days, you need to be family friendly. And they have wanted us to act on childcare for so long. So I think the conversation we now need to be into is how do we make sure that we've got this really good So how do you? Because Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education Secretary, your colleague, gave a big keynote speech on this uh, last week, but there was no detail about la what Labour would actually do. So, as, as, as I've said, we have identified something that we could do immediately around breakfast clubs. And that's not just because it could be done quickly and we need to help people. You know, if we were in government tomorrow, we would prioritise things that we could do quickly. But also because we need to allow schools to help support childcare better because of the early years connection that I mentioned. And I think we now need to get into this. How do we make sure that we develop our workforce? And that's exactly what Bridget's working on. In my own area of employment, we've been thinking for a long time about
about how this issue of the universal credit reform, which is now happening, could have been done years ago. But there's more to it. Lone parent employment, for example, okay. is actually falling after a long time of rising. So we need to work out, can we make work more flexible so that single parents can also have yeah. a fair crack at a good career? It it's a big, it's an important subject, but I do want to move on because we've got an awful lot to, to get to today. But before we do, I just want to tell you it has been confirmed uh, that the UK government has taken the decision to ban TikTok from ministers' phones, something that we were discussing earlier. We said we would update you if that were to come to pass, and it has. Now, I want to talk about something else which is budget-related. It wasn't in the Chancellor's speech that he gave at the dispatch box. Rather, it was in the reams of papers that form the budget books that go around it. And this is about migration figures. Before we get into the detail, I want to play you a clip of one of our panellists, Danny Kruger, who asked a question about this at Prime Minister's Questions yesterday. Mr Speaker, on Monday, the Home Secretary said... That in recent decades, there has been, the immigration to this country has been too high, and all the benches opposite howled their disapproval. They want higher immigration, not lower. Does my one honourable friend agree that what we need to do is, rather than importing cheap foreign labour, we need to invest in the skills of our own young people and encourage businesses to do the same? Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right that we do need to encourage long-term investment in the domestic workforce. We'll hear more from this in the Chancellor later this afternoon, but the Department for Work and Pensions is directing support at sectors with labour shortages like construction and social care, and our new skills boot camps are part of a dramatic rebooting of our skills system to support workers to get the skills that they need. So that was you, Danny Kruger, asking a question. Oh, was that a slightly strange situation where you're having to watch yourself back at our insistence? <laughs> so my apologies yes, for that. You. But on the principle of what you were saying, you were saying rather than importing cheap foreign labour, it's about investing in our own workforce. But in reality, in that Office for Budget Responsibilities book, they say mm. net migration is going to settle at around 245,000 a year. And part of that is about plugging gaps in the workforce. So it's not coming down. It's not lower. It's not, no. And the long-term trend needs to be to invest in our own people rather than continuing on, the, on, this, on this sort of cheap fix, which we've had for 20 or 30 years, of importing, uh, importing foreign workers. I mean, it, it is necessary. And, in fact, the Chancellor yesterday announced uh, a, a scheme to... Allow, allow businesses to bring in construction workers to plug gaps in their spaces. On the spaces. shortage occupation. That's right, yeah. and I think that's appropriate and necessary. But the overall trend has to be about investing in our own people. Ultimately, it's not fair on British workers, and it's not fair on, on the developing world, which is sending its brightest and best to our country. So the trend needs to change. But, yes, I regret the reliance on immigration that our economy has at the moment. Cr critically, the important thing is it does grow GDP when you bring in foreign workers. What it doesn't do is grow GDP per head. So yeah. it actually depresses the wealth of ordinary British families when we bring in foreign labour. OK, OK. Well, let's, let's talk to somebody about this now. Um, Alex Phillips from uh, Reform UK you can join us. Um, Alex, hello. Thanks for being on the programme. You heard what Danny Kruger was saying there about it's not ideal, but the OBR saying effectively it is necessary to plug gaps in the workforce right now. What do you think? Well, I don't think that's strictly true, actually, because I listened to the interview on the Today programme this morning with the chair of the OBR, who, as Danny said, pointed out that there will be a small uptick in GDPR, uh, GDP overall output, but this won't affect GDP per capita. But look, we've got to take stock of the numbers here. This should be massive headlines. A quarter of a million people net, not gross, net per year. Every four years, a million extra people. That's a city the size of Birmingham coming in. And actually, the increase of GDP output would be tenths of a percent. So what we're doing, and also what the chair of the OBR said, is we don't necessarily think that the migrants coming in and this mass influx are going to contribute to the workforce at a greater ratio than the, the native population. So we're essentially just building and growing at an exponential rate. The population of this country... And it's not actually doing much to plug those gaps when actually what's happening is you're also increasing the number of mouths around the table to feed. NHS at breaking point, everybody can see that. Housing crisis. How on oh, earth? OK, hang, uh, hang on. And, and, and businesses themselves, the businesses themselves, including businesses like the CBI, are saying that there does need to be migration to fill gaps in the workforce, which is holding back growth. 
Well, listen, there may need to be in sectors such as the NHS, but what you've got to look at... And do you well, know border than the NHS. The CBI doesn't represent the NHS. Listen, when the, when the points-based system was brought in, Boris Johnson, you know, Mr Red Wall himself, actually advertised one half of UK jobs to foreign workers. It's not working. You may have to look at thresholds and sectors on an industrial basis and say, where do we need certain workers? But unless you actually introduce some form of cap and actually okay. look at things visas, spousal visas. We cannot, cannot, anyone who thinks that the population growing by a million people every four years is sustainable is either deceiving or deluded. OK, Reem? I mean, look, we need to fill fill in the vacancies at the moment. And I'm sorry, but we can kiss goodbye to this this entire notion of growth if we don't fill in this gap. Now, ideally, we would be filling in that gap with people that already live here that are on out-of-work benefits. I believe a figure last year was about 5.2 million people on out-of-work benefits in the United Kingdom. Yeah. However, if those people are not going to go back to work, and it's probably politically impossible for the government to, to get those people back into work, because, again, once you give people uh, that, that reliance on the state, it's, it's much more... More difficult for them to come off it. Of course, we need to fill in the gap somehow, and it has to be with migrants. Alison, what would Labour be doing here? So there's there's 1.2 million people who are unemployed. There's also a big group of people who are out of work, not currently looking, but who want a job. And we've got plans to provide really tailored support where people are, because as we were talking before, the economy is different in different places. So we would make sure that people's um, support was tailored to them to get them the best job possible. I have to say, you know, we shouldn't be having a go at people who do the dignified thing and come and get a job and look after their family and add to our country. Now, I think that sort of rhetoric is damaging. If we want to help people have a better job and a better career, we need an end to the failed schemes that we've seen under the DWP, under the last government. And we need to really focus in, on those places where we have got high unemployment, like Blackpool, um, and working out how to have a plan for that economy that, that brings people into it, which simply hasn't happened. Keir Starmer that's, that's himself, the though, has to... talked about the fact that he doesn't want to rely... He wants, to, he wants so, the domestic workforce to be skilled so up rather than be, relying on immigration. That's what he spoke our about. Our mission on economic growth particularly looks at growth per capita because that's the best way to make sure that that growth is inclusive and that wherever you are in the country, your town or your city has a plan for growth. That's the best way to make sure our country grows in a healthy and sustainable way. OK. But, you know, I don't, I don't think some of the rhetoric that's been used on this is all that helpful, really. Naomi? Migration is brilliant. It is wonderful. It enriches societies. It makes cultures better. It boosts... Uh, uh, every every part of our lives, I think it is important that somebody sits and 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 makes that point and says that you know migration is great, and I mean emigration as well as immigration, migration in the round. And what we've lost with Brexit, of course, is not just um, the the freedom of movement of, of people coming to the UK, but young British people have lost the right to we go and live, love, and work and, and and study uh, in twenty seven other member states. Alison's right, we've got 1.1 million vacancies. They are not just in the NHS, they are across hospitality, uh, agriculture, many, many sectors. Um, and these, these don't need to be binary things. You don't either need to fill them with upskilling the domestic workforce or uh, being reliant on immigration. We can do both. We can, in the short term, make sure that we've got uh, access for businesses to fill those gaps if they need to by bringing people in from abroad, while investing very heavily in the skills agenda, which we've not done. And actually, business and government need to work together uh, uh, on that skills agenda far more than they have been in countries like Germany. You see that happening far better. Um, but but I think to, to allow a narrative of, um, you know, immigrants and immigration being reliant on them, we, we should be grateful to them. They've got us through some many sticky wickets and the NHS is on its knees, partly because, uh, you know, 10,000 NHS workers were okay. EU workers that have left. I mean, Alex, that is right, isn't it, actually? People that have come to this country have really helped some sectors, including the NHS, keep going for a long time. Some people have. I'm not denying that. And, you know, I'm going to call everybody out who's talking about rhetoric and divisive language. I don't understand where this divisive language is supposedly being heard because I'm not attacking migrants. What I'm saying is a million people every four years is completely 
unsustainable. You cannot build houses and hospitals fast enough. And what isn't being discussed here is the negative impact that happens on the on the blue collar workers in this country. For instance, if you want okay. to come in at a threshold of skilled jobs, you have to be able to get in a job at eighty percent of the salary. Now that that barrier has been lowered, which means the negative effect of wage compression on builders, on carpenters, on brickies in this country is dreadful. My father was a lorry driver. Okay. This happened to him. I grew up seeing this firsthand. And this isn't being divisive. This is just calling out facts. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we, we are approaching the end of the programme and we've got other things that we want to get in. But thank you very much for your time. Danny, uh, just a final thought on that. Do you think the government is on the right, in the right place on this? I think we need to be clearer about the direction of travel. But yes, the, the fundamental uh, agenda is right. And I would share the points about investment in skills. The good thing about what happened yesterday, another good thing, is the new universal support system and the reforms to disability uh, system Briefly, which will Alison. enable people it's, to come it, back into work. Briefly. I mean, that is for a tiny number of people. Um, it's about uh, 200 million a year. It's a small, small number of people. That's, you know, like, that's a fifth of what they spent on the big um, tax boom. I think it will not have a great effect at all. What we need is to have towns and cities where they've got a great college that people can go to, where we really focus on the actual barriers people face. That's the way to get people into work, you know, not kind of initiative okay. itis, yet more from the DWP. A big and important subject and no doubt one that we will return to. But um, I want to use our last few minutes to discuss something a little bit different. Uh, take a look at this headline in the Daily Mail. Workers at Jeremy Clarkson's diddly squat farm shop are forced to wear body cameras to record abuse from angry locals, council planners are told, as TV presenter battles to extend car park. This is something that's featured in the Amazon programme Clarkson's Farm, this ongoing um, battle, if you want to call it that, between Jeremy Clarkson and the local authority about whether he can put various things on his farm. Let's have a little look at a clip from that programme. We've got to go through another planning process with old Sky and I, boy. Well, it's, it's going to be over a year, 18 okay. months. I mean, that's just going to be what, another planning committee meeting and then another and... Well, it's ridiculous because over in the field, as you know, we've got a barn there been there uh, 100 years. So after 10 years, you can do what you want. And at the moment, they say farmers can use a barn for a pop-up shop or... And you could turn that into something straight away. Hold on, well, that barn over yeah, there... Yeah, the barn in the middle of the field. We don't need planning permission. No. OK, a little, a little taste there of Jeremy Clarkson and his own particular issues. Um, but the kind of broader issue here about is there a sort of inherent tension between uh, local planning rules and economic growth? Danny Kruger? Yes, yes, of course there is, because land is finite and communities want to preserve their green fields very naturally and rightly. What we need, I think, is to square that circle by ensuring that communities drive... Uh, housing development particularly we're talking about, although Jeremy's point about business development is critical too. We do need to enable businesses to set up. I think the answer personally is more community-led development. What we need is, everywhere recognises we need more, more building, more housing in particular, but it should be driven by communities themselves. And there are schemes, community land trusts in particular, the ones I favour the most, whereby communities are responsible for building the houses and potentially allocating them to local families rather than people coming from... But every time you enter into some sort of idea of planning reform, it gets caught up in a, in a political quagmire, particularly within your own party. Yes, and that's why there is a reform going through at the moment which will help to liberate uh, development but also ensure that local places can control what happens in their areas. OK, Alison, what would Labour do with this? Would there be a loosening of local regulation? Well, certainly in Merseyside, we've got a huge amount of brownfield sites, derelict land, former industrial land, where we really want to build. So I would say to anybody, if we want to grow our economy, come and invest in Merseyside because we can do that in a and way And the local authority is supportive of that? Because there are, so. of course, we know systems that have to be gone through legally. People have to apply for planning commission. Yeah, but, if you, but, but I mean, if you look at, um, as I say, particular areas like my own um, in, in the north of England, local authorities are crying out to deal with some of these areas of de dereliction. And Danny says land is finite. Well, sure, but we've, we've actually got loads of land. What we need is the investment. So let's make that happen, I would say. We've got to do this in the, in the light of climate change. You know, we need to look at all of our policies and say, OK, where do we actually need to preserve... Yeah green space given the climate challenge we face. Naomi, do you think that there is a challenge between, you know, building where it's needed, but also the point that Alison makes about the wider environment and, of course, green spaces? There are so many brownfield sites in the UK, even within the green belt of London, uh, some of which is uh, brownfield sites that could be used for development. Um, the issue that NIMBYists, those in, in not in my backyard, the people that try and block planning... There are also NIMBYs now, I think. There yes, are, in my there backyard. are NIMBYs. There's a very good campaign called NIMBYs. Um, the issue is that 
that they often have is that there aren't the other supporting infrastructures to absorb the extra housing development. So it's not just a case of saying yes to the housing. It's that actually you would need another GP surgery. You may need another school, etc. So I think the more that government can do to uh, provide the infrastructure that goes alongside new development, the more likely you will be to get local resident consent for it. I mean, for all this talk about deregulating the planning system, there does have to be protections for local communities. Well, I, I think what's clear about this situation is that the planning system is brokered and that unfortunately because of the, the amalgamation of regulations and, and the amount of support that the local people have to have in order for us to be able to build any of these homes means that actually building just stops completely and unfortunately that means for people like myself for this younger generation that people cannot afford our own homes. I probably won't be able to afford my own home unless I win the lottery in the next 10 years so <laughs> I think that what's clear about the situation is that we need to deregulate and liberate the planning okay. system in order for us to build more homes. Well we wish you luck with that lottery win. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come back and let us know if you do. Just a quick note, West Oxford District Council, which is involved in that um, argument with Jeremy Clarkson, uh, they say that they have given uh, lots of planning permissions to the farm on his site, um, but it is a complicated and uh, situation and it is in a protected area. Anyway, that is all from us. I'll be back tomorrow with Politics UK at 12.15. I hope you can join me then. Goodbye.